All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Duncan, and I am a librarian with Peace Library System. Uh, today's session is going to be all about homework help tools and databases. So we're going to be going over things like um, encyclopedias. We'll go over some academic search engines and then some uh, homework helping tools that are um, going to be directly relevant to the Alberta curriculum, which is really, really great. But before we dive in, we're going to do a land acknowledgement. Peace Library System acknowledges that we are located on the Treaty 8 territory of the Cree, Beaver, and Dene people and Region 6 of the Métis Nation of Alberta. We are grateful to live, work, and learn together on this land, which has been home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples since time immemorial. We recognize this land as an act of reconciliation, and we also commit to supporting and celebrating our local Indigenous communities while working to break down institutional barriers to make our libraries equitable and accessible. So why this webinar? Well, at the moment, um, PLS does not subscribe to any um, encyclopedia or educational database ourselves. Um, we do have access to a few databases thanks to the Alberta Library, and I'll show you where to find that. Um, but previously, we used to subscribe to what is called World Book Online, which was like a big digital encyclopedia, and it covered major areas of knowledge, so things like science, technology, and history. Um, we have looked at other educational databases um, and encyclopedias. However, they are very expensive. Um, and the situation is if we choose to subscribe to a database, then we have to look at um, our other e-resources and pick stuff to go. So we kind of have to find a middle ground for um, getting the information, but also working within our own budget. But here are a few that we have looked at um, and I've been in meetings for just to get a little bit more info. So if your library does have an immediate need for a database or um, encyclopedia, a digital encyclopedia rather, um, and you and your board are interested, these are companies that I would recommend. So of course, World Book Online, ProQuest has lots of different um, databases that you can search within. And then also Gale in Context. And these specifically, the elementary, middle school, and high school are three separate databases um, that you would have to pay three separate prices for. But they are available. Um, they are they are pretty expensive though. So just be aware of that, that it's not, it's not cheap. Um, which is why we don't have it um, in our e-resource suite at the moment. But we do have alternatives, and lots of these alternatives are free. Um, so the main goal of today is to introduce you to these free sites and these free resources, and so that you know that they exist. So if you do get questions about patrons looking for um, homework help, or they're looking to do some kind of research, even academic research, um, after today you'll have a place to direct them towards. Now, as we go through the webinar, I'm going to be using some of the following terms. So I thought I would just go over the definitions briefly um, so that we're all on the same page and we don't get confused as to which is which. Because sometimes, bad habit, I'll use these interchangeably. But there is differences. So a database, when I say database, I'm referring to an organized collection of information. And there can be databases for all kinds of topics, um, like we looked at the Gale ones. Um, where it's databases for elementary students, a database for middle school, a database for high school students. Um, and purchasing a database is typically going to grant you access to all the information that is stored within that, that database. Now, the main difference, um, and I kind of pair databases and encyclopedias together, the main difference is that a database gathers its information from many different sources and puts it into the database, whereas an encyclopedia the information that is stored in an encyclopedia is written by authors who work for that specific encyclopedia. And when I say encyclopedia, I'm referring to um, like a reference work that contains information on all aspects of knowledge relating to a specific subject. So for example, a medical encyclopedia would have articles written by authors um, who work for that encyclopedia, but it would also only contain info related to the treatment of illness and injuries. It's not going to have information on like graphic novels um, or book clubs, right? Uh, search engine. Search engines are programs that search for information using keywords or phrases. 
Um, typically, they're going to search all over the internet and show your results. So it's not searching within an encyclopedia. It's not searching within a database. It's going to be searching all over the internet. Um, and the only downside of this is that your results, because we're not subscribing to a search engine, um, some of the results may not be freely available. They might ask you to pay for certain articles to view. Um, whereas if you're subscribed or have access to a database or encyclopedia and you're searching within one of them, you're going to have access to all the information that's stored there. And then lastly, digital resource. Um, when I say digital resource, I'm just referring to materials or tools that have been created digitally or with digital use in mind. Um, basically anything that doesn't fit the above three terms. Um, I'll just use the term digital resource. All right, so I want to briefly go over sources as it relates to research, because as we go through some of the databases and search engines, you may see references to primary and secondary sources. So when we talk about primary sources, primary sources are immediate firsthand accounts of a topic or from people who have had a direct connection with it. So a primary source could be maybe a painting, like a piece of artwork or someone's diary, or maybe you're interviewing uh, the subject. So the words coming from that subject's mouth are the primary source. It's coming directly from, from them. Whereas a secondary source is one step removed from a primary source. Um, so they can cover the same topic, but they often add a layer of interpretation or analysis. So instead of a painting, maybe it's an article critiquing the painting, right? Or um, instead of a diary, maybe it's a book about um, about that diary, right? And, and that's the source we're referencing in a paper, and that's considered our secondary source because it's not the actual diary itself. It's a text about the diary. Um, and other examples, like things like biographies, um, reviews of plays, essay on a treaty. So those are just some examples of different types of sources that you might see. Now, it's really important to cite our sources. Citations are a really good way of giving credit when certain material in your work comes from another source. Um, it also gives your readers the information necessary to find that source again. So you'll find, and we'll get to this closer to the end, but you'll find in lots of academic articles, they list their sources in a reference section at the very end of their article or their paper. And this allows um, readers who are reading the paper to look at those sources and know where the information is coming from that you're presenting. Um, so we cite not only to give the author, uh, the source, author, blah, 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 source, source author's credit, it's a tongue twister, <laughs> Um, but it also gives authority to our work because we're not just making stuff up and putting it on paper. We are showing that we've done the research. Others have said the same thing. Um, so it gives it, it gives it a little bit more, a little bit more strength. Um, and then again, it also leaves a trail for other scholars to follow, um, which is nice, right? So if you're, if you have a reader who's interested in the paper you've written and they want to find out more about it, they can always go to your reference section and check out all the sources and then they'll have a million different uh, sources they can explore on that same topic. Uh, and of course, we're always going to cite whenever we are referencing an idea um, that has not been expressed by ourselves, that has already been expressed by someone else. So when we're using the words or the thoughts of someone else, or if we're using a direct quote um, or paraphrasing in our work, we want to make sure we're citing that. Uh, now, there are different types of citations and different subject disciplines call for different citation information to be written in very specific orders. So these are three uh, of the most common styles, MLA, APA, and Chicago. And this is citing a paper, um, How Women Have Fared as Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Since the Passage of Title IX. And you'll notice that some of them have apostrophes or quotation marks, rather, and some don't. So there's slight differences in how these are written down, um, but you don't have to memorize this. If someone comes in and they say, I need to um, do research for this paper and I need to make sure the citing is in APA, um, we can refer them to the citation machine, which is a really, um, really useful tool. And I'll show you. So my citation machine is a website and it helps you create citations 
um, by just entering your information into a form and then it creates the citation for you so you can copy and paste it into your paper. So I would click on create citations. It's going to ask me what type of source I'm using. So maybe I'm using a website or a book or an academic journal. If I click more, there's a whole bunch of other options on the side here. But for our sake, we'll just pretend it's a journal. It's going to present you with the screen to search for either like an ISBN number or a DOI number. But we can just ignore this part because we're going to click manual citation. And this brings us to a form where we can type in, if I type in test, the article title, the author's first and last name. You can add additional authors if there are more. Enter all the publication information of your journal or your book. And then once done, you'd click create citation. And then what it wants you to do is it wants you to pay nine bucks or 10 bucks a month, but you can bypass this by watching, I think it's a 30 second ad. And then it'll give you your citation, which you can then copy and paste into your work. And it'll allow you to choose between MLA, APA or Chicago style um, for your style of citation. So that's a really helpful tool, um, maybe something to bookmark that you can refer patrons to. All right, but let's dive in because I have like over 10 different websites and tools I wanna show you. So I'm gonna try and go through all of them pretty fast so we can uh, talk a little bit about all of them. But first we'll start with some resources that can be used for homework help. This is mainly for younger grades, but um, some of it can go from the K to 12 range. And all of the following resources are free or free to use for patrons um, through PLS. So I'm going to talk about all of them first, and then I'll exit out and we'll go through all of them on online. So Solero is, uh, of course, a PLS resource that we subscribe to. Um, it's a homework help tool, has like lessons, practice tests. What I really like is that it aligns with the Alberta provincial curriculum. Um, so you can check uh, which grade you want, you can choose your uh, course, and then it's going to have all the same learning outcomes that students would be learning in schools uh, at this moment in time. If you're familiar with the key study guides, um, the company that makes the key, Castle Rock, also makes Solero. So it's the same information, um, the same kind of setup. So if you are very familiar with the key, um, and you have students who either can't get it from the library or can't purchase it from the bookstore, Solero would be a good um, alternate. Uh, DK Find Out is a uh, encyclopedia for younger grades. Um, lots of information on here on all sorts of different topics, things like earth, history, the human body. Um, it's age appropriate written, so um, you could give it to a younger student and it is written in a way that they can read. I always think that this could be used for something like elementary research projects, but we'll dive into that shortly. Um, Anytime Help Anywhere, these are videos that um, are aimed at junior high students and they explain uh, lots of key concepts. So things in like math and science, um, very visual uh, videos. They um, show you exactly how to do things like find the, the area of a triangle or the circumference of a circle. So I find these really helpful and they're created by the Edmonton Public School Division. Um, so again, as an Alberta focus, I feel comfortable and confident knowing that. Uh, below that, I have the Alberta Teachers Association Library Guides, and these are really interesting. These have um, like tons of free learning resources that are directly aligned with the Alberta curriculum. So it's all these like lib guides that you can go into um, for subject or grade or topic. And then it'll list all these resources that you can use to either help study or just to learn in general. And then the last one I'll show you is the Open Library, which is a part of this site called the Internet Archive. And what this is, is it's a student library for grades K to 12. And these are free books that have been scanned online that you can borrow and read. Um, you do have to create an account or you can use an existing Google account to access this. But um, it's, it's very neat and there's a lot of materials. But we'll, 
All right, let's start with Solero because that is kind of the biggest one of the bunch. So from the PLS website or your own library website, you're going to go to e-resources and then you're going to scroll down to S for Solero. Click in and I'm going to go over it briefly. We do have a whole webinar dedicated to Solero that goes much more in depth. So that's on our YouTube channel. It's called Intro to Solero. Um, if you want to learn more or if you have questions about stuff we don't cover right now. But it asks for your library barcode and PIN to log in. It wants you to create a Solero account. And once you've done that, you can click. You saw where I clicked. Click here to log in. And this is my account information. Give me an auto-generated username. And this is our homepage in Solero. So these are where the courses that I'm currently working on or taking a look at live. Um, if I want to add a course to my homepage, I'm going to click on this blue Add Course button. And this will bring me to a little shopping table. So what I can do is select the region I'm in. So I'm in Alberta, but you'll notice that there's also all of the Canadian territories um, and provinces and then all of the American states in here as well. But I'll choose Alberta. I'm going to choose choose grade nine. And so when I update it, what it tends to do is it's going to show you the grade you selected, and then it's going to show you the grade below and the grade above. And then anything that you previously selected is also going to stay there so that if you want to remove certain courses, you can. I like this, though, because maybe you are in grade nine math, um, struggling a bit because you didn't fully learn a math concept in grade eight. So if you know that, you can select both math eight and math nine and have them both on your homepage so that you can go into each of them um, at ease. But I'm going to select science nine and click save. And then we'll see, oh, I have a lot of science here now. I have my science nine course all ready to go. So when I click into a course, and this is how all the courses on Solero are set up, it's going to have your topics or your units at the top here. There's an assessment section in the middle, which will have uh, pre and post tests, uh, practice tests that combine all sorts of different questions from all the units. Um, the tests we can also access within the units themselves, and there's quizzes too, but we'll get to that. And then once you finish tests and quizzes, you can click on assessment results and it'll show you um, exactly how well you're doing in certain areas so that you know which areas you need to focus more on. And then at the bottom, uh, we have a way to access all of the flashcards and notes that we have made within our topics. So I'm going to go into environmental chemistry. All right, so you'll see that there are kind of subtopics or subunits with the, the black title. And then under them, we have all of the different uh, learning outcomes or learning standards. And they call them lessons in Solero. Um, so every time you click into a lesson, it's going to check off as green as being completed. So you'll notice if I scroll down, some of these I've clicked into and others are gray and noted as incomplete. So this can be a way for parents to check uh, which lessons their children have clicked into and if they are working through the entirety of the topic or the unit. And then once you click through all of them, it has a practice quiz that you can take at the end of each subtopic. And once you've worked through all of those, there is a practice test at the very end that will combine questions from all the quizzes uh, and all the lessons. But let's click into one, uh, nutrient intake uh, by plants. So when I click into a lesson, this is what it looks like. They are written at a grade appropriate level. So grade nine content is written at a grade nine level. Grade three content is written at a grade three level. But the student would read through. They can click onto their next lesson. And then they can go and take the quiz for this section. Now, when they are in the lesson themselves, using the highlighting tool is going to give you the note and the flashcard option. So if this is a, an area of concern or maybe an area I need, I know I need to work on a little bit more, maybe I'm going to add a note just to remind myself. And the notes live on the left-hand side here. If I want to make a flashcard, 
anything that I highlight, if I highlight this part here, is going to live in the answer section of my flashcard. So then I can type in a question at the top, hit save, and I have a flashcard that I've created. Go back to our Science 9 course. And I'll show you for those notes and flashcards that we just made, if I click on notes, it's going to show me all the notes that I've made within all the different lessons. And same with flashcards, it's going to combine all the uh, flashcards that I've made by unit. So it says I've made three flashcards in this environmental chemistry unit, and then I can go through them and it'll randomize and I can quiz myself on on areas that I need to study more. Um, pre and post tests. So I can go in and I can click uh, a test that I might be working on. So this is a year end test. This combines questions from all of the different units. They are multiple choice. This is what they look like when you click in. So I can If you are working through the test and you select an answer, but you are just guessing, you can click the just guessing button and it will indicate that that is a question that you guessed. So then that way, when you were reviewing your answers, if you guessed and you did got, get this right, you know that you probably still need to study this because you were just guessing. But once you finish your exam, it'll give you um, all of your answers, which ones you've gotten right. I got a really good score, got 2%. <laughs> Um, but again, it'll show you which ones you've guessed with uh, by making the icon kind of squiggly as opposed to perfectly circular. And then you can review your answers by review this one. And it's going to tell you exactly which learning outcome it comes from. So you can click into that lesson and review it. And it also explains the solution. So it explains um, why that answer is the correct one. It doesn't just say correct, it gives you a full explanation, which is really helpful, especially for studying for um, end of the year exams. And then once you've taken a few tests and quizzes, you can click on your assessment results and this will compile all of them. So ob obviously I haven't finished a lot of these because I'm not in grade nine, um, but you can go through and see which ones you've gotten good grades on, which ones you've not gotten so much good grades on, and then readjust your study habits from there. So that's kind of the basics of the courses in Solero. The last thing I'll show you is if you click on the bar up here and click on My Progress, there are a few helpful tools. Um, one is the calendar. So the calendar tool will show you exactly what days you've logged in and what exactly you've done on those days whether you've gone through lessons or taken quizzes. The next tab, Standards Report, is going to break down the course by its uh, lessons and outcomes. And then based on the quizzes and tests you've taken, um, it's going to let you know which questions from those outcomes you've gotten right and which ones you've gotten wrong. So this is another way to see, oh, I've gotten a lot of this outcome or this standard correct. Um, but maybe not so much this one. So this is a standard that I'm going to go in and um, review the lessons for a little bit more thoroughly. Um, the next tab, activity report. Every time you click into a lesson or complete a quiz, it gives you these uh, stars, which you can use in the rewards tab to buy your avatar character little clothing. But that is the basics of Solero. Um, Again, if you want to learn more about it, we do have a webinar that is dedicated to it, and that is on the PLS YouTube channel. Okay, DK Find Out um, is an encyclopedia aimed at younger grades. Where's my, there we go. Um, so it gives you all your subjects down here. So maybe I'm doing a book report on animals. Um, so I can keep, I'm going to do reptiles and yeah, snake. So what I love is that there's all sorts of things to click on. That's going to give you all sorts of different information. If you scroll down, they have more links. They'll have some fast facts on your topic. And then they also have a kind of like a history of what you clicked on to get to the current page you're at. So if I'm 
no longer want to do it on snakes, my elementary research project, I can click back to reptiles, and maybe I want to do it on uh, lizards instead. Dragon lizards. That's kind of cool. So yeah, lots of different subjects that you can explore through, but a great site to just set up a set up a kiddo with and be like, uh, find something you like and we'll do your research project on that. All right, these are the junior high videos I was talking about. Again, these are created by the Edmonton Public School Division. Um, it's called Anytime Help Anywhere, but you would click on a subject. So maybe it's math I'm struggling in, shapes and space. And it lists all the videos that they've created at the top here. But you can also scroll through and see all the different uh, subjects. So this one, how is the area of a rectangle calculated? So I really like it. It gives really good visual language um, for the concept. So that can be really helpful for visual learners or just those who are struggling with some of these uh, key concepts that are really important in junior high. All right, this is the Alberta Teachers Association Library Guides. So these are resources, kind of like LibGuides created by um, members of the ATA. But you can go in, I'm gonna click on Subject Guides. And then it has all these different web guides. I'm going to click on by subject. And it has all the different um, subjects that would be taught in schools. So maybe I have a patron who is struggling in math. I'll click on mathematics. It gives me which uh, grade. So maybe they are in grade three. And it brings me to all these different resources that have been compiled that are directly relevant to the Alberta curriculum. Um, I can click on the side here for different mathematical topics, maybe measurement. And then some of these are games. Some of these are um, web pages that users can read. But like this one, for example, Dino Dive brings me to a measurement flash game, um, so which can be a fun way to learn measurement. Let's go back and we'll try chemistry for grades 10 to 12. And we can see, okay, this is bringing me, oh, sciences. I can go to Chem 20 if I want. Maybe I'm struggling with uh, the forms of matter unit. And then it has all these different resources that I can use to help me study uh, that particular unit in Chemistry 20. So really useful, a lot of things to click on within here. Um, so I would definitely recommend featuring this or um, checking it out yourself. All right, and the last homework help tool I'm showing is the Open Library Student Library, which is part of the Internet Archive up here. So again, these are books that have been scanned online that you can freely borrow. You just need to either um, use your Google account or create a free account on here. I believe I'm logged in. Once you borrow a title, and you'll notice they're sorted by grade. Oh, it won't let me. Let's try this one. What's unique about this is that the books aren't simultaneous use. So if someone else is reading that particular book, uh, you do have to wait. But this can be a good alternate um, way to find book if maybe the library doesn't have it, you're doing a book report, or um, you're unable to get it from a bookstore and you need it right away. Go through here and read the book directly in your browser. Now you can't upload these onto an e-reader like a Kobo or a Kindle um, because it's not the same file type. But you'll notice there's all sorts of different books. And if you go just to Open Library, you can search for books that go beyond the K to 12 range. All right. Let's move on. We're going to talk about um, databases that are centered around um, kind of specific information that they're searching for. So these can be really helpful for patrons looking to do um, research. Um, 
depending on how specific that is. Um, but remember, databases gather information from many different types of sources. So the information that we click on could look completely different, you know, page to page. So we'll take a look at, we do have access to some ProQuest databases, and this is thanks to the Alberta Library. Um, and some of those databases include uh, the Canadian News Stream, the Corona Research, uh, Coronavirus Research Database, the Calgary Herald Historical Newspapers, and then any publicly available content that ProQuest has. Um, we also have access to some Gale uh, primary sources um, through the Alberta Library with the Alberta Research Portal. And so we'll take a look at a few of those as well. Um, the Alberta Open Government Portal, this is really interesting, is a collection of data sets and publications by the Alberta government and its adjacent agencies. Um, so all sorts of different reports that the Alberta government publishes, you can usually find them on this portal. Um, Library and Archives Canada has a whole bunch of uh, heritage information that is linked to uh, Canadian history, and the history of Canada, a lot of really good uh, genealogy tools as well, if you are into that. Uh, what is next? ERIC. So ERIC is a bibliographic and full text database of education research. So this is kind of specific to the education field. Um, but if you have someone who's looking specifically for academic research related to education, this would be a great tool for them to use. And then down here, this is unique. This is um, the MIT Open Courseware site, which is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And they've uploaded full courses and course materials from MIT classes. So like um, lecture notes, the readings that would have been done, and even sometimes assignments. So it allows you to download the whole course and you can take it on your own. Um, you do not get accredited for it. Like you will not be receiving a certificate or a degree but you can basically take post-secondary courses without attending post-secondary, which is really cool. And MIT isn't the only school that does this. I know, I think Harvard has some of their courses posted online somewhere as well, and a few other schools. So something to be aware of that this information exists and it's out there. You just have to search for it. All right, we did Solero. Let's look at our ProQuest databases. So to get to our ProQuest ones, it's actually linked under e-resources under the Calgary Herald archives. And when we click on that, we've linked it that way because this is the most frequently used. It'll bring you to a space where you can search within the Calgary Herald archives. But if you click on the ProQuest logo in the top corner, it's gonna bring you to the ProQuest search bar. And then from here we can search um, but we can also click on change databases and we can search within any of the four databases we have access to. So if we only want to search for uh, stuff related to the coronavirus research database, we can deselect the others and search that way. But I'm going to use all four. All right. And Halloween. October. And you'll notice there's all sorts of different um, types of information on here. So this one is a website. This one comes from a newspaper. This is uh, an article, it looks like, from a scholarly journal. And it looks like the full text is available as well. You'll notice as we look at more scholarly content, we want to be looking for full text and PDF. So we want to make sure we don't have to pay it to get that content. Um, and it's also searching through the Calgary Herald newspaper archives. So we have a lot of newspaper results as well. So this is something about Carmel Apples that was published in uh, Niagara Falls, looks like in October, 2022. So lots of, lots of different information in the ProQuest uh, databases. Next is the Alberta Research Portal. So this is our way to get to some of the Gale primary source database collections. Again, thanks to the Alberta Library. If you click on collections at the top here, it should list all the different collections that we can search within. So you can search within these individually, or if you just go to the main search bar, it's gonna search all of them. But this just, this just gives you a little bit of an idea 
what exactly, what collections exactly we are searching in. But I'm gonna go back home, type in my search term. And you'll notice this looks a little bit different than the ProQuest search result page. It has um, results for all sorts of different formats. So we have video results, magazines, images. Um, I've seen maps up here before. But as you scroll down, they put them in these nice little collections here. So if we only want to search for newspapers, magazines, or only photographs, they even have some images that they've taken. But maybe I'm clicking on magazines and I'm looking for, I don't know, this. And depending on what you click on, it's going to look different too. But this looks like one page of a magazine that they pulled the word Halloween out of, so they brought it up in our results. It's a table of contents, it looks like, for the magazine. But yeah, lots of different formats for you to go through, depending on what you're looking for. Maybe you are looking for photographs or images to use. But that is um, the Alberta Research Portal. All right, next is the Open Government Portal, and this is from the Government of Alberta. So again, this is a collection of data sets and publications by the Alberta government. Um, the most recent ones are linked here. You can go down. Um, for example, the leading causes of death, a ranking of the 30 most common causes of death each year in Alberta by ranking and total number of deaths was published or updated rather on September 22nd. So I can go in, I can download the information. Oftentimes it's an Excel sheet. And this is giving me the causes of death, the most common causes of death. Interesting. Um, if I go back. But you can also use the search bar here. So maybe I'm interested in driver training. Hey, why are you not working now? Here we go. Driver's licenses by my municipality. I was looking for a different one, but they must have taken it down. It's strange because I was just using it. But anyway, maybe you're looking for this information, driver licenses by municipality. Click on this. Oh, and this brings me to like a separate page on the Alberta government website, which will give me more accurate information. So I can click on the different, looks like counties, and it'll tell me exactly how many licenses are within each county. Interesting. Anyway, lots of different publications and type of info that you can get to from here. Really fun to poke around and explore. All right, Library and Archives Canada is a Government of Canada website. You can choose French or English. Um, again, lots of information related to the history of Canada and the history of Canadians. I would recommend coming down here and looking at the A to Z tools and guides or searching the collections. So from here, you can get access to things like census information, or this is a neat tool. This is a collection of dissertations and theses from Canadian universities. Um, the A to Z tools and guides has all the different collections that they have on Library and Archives Canada. So for example, Acts of Divorce from 1841 to 1968. And then it'll bring you to this page where you can search by name for the act of divorce between those years, which could be really helpful for uh, genealogy research. All right. Eric is our education research um, database. So we can type in, if I type in the word 
library. It's going to search for uh, lots of academic and scholarly literature related to um, the education field. It's going to let me know on the right hand side whether it has been peer reviewed um, and if there is a direct link to it. Sometimes these direct links will link you to um, the journal that the article is coming from, the journal's website. And if it is not open access, meaning if it is not freely available, they're going to ask you to pay a fee to view the article. So what we want to do is look for um, download full text. Anything that is download or full text or PDF, those tend to be freely available. And we'll see when I click on it, the article comes up ready for me to read. Academic work usually always has an abstract that's like a 250 word overview of the article. And then at the end, because I was mentioning this earlier, they will have a references section that lists all of their references in um, their citation style that you can go through if you are interested in learning more about this particular paper. All right, and this is the MIT Open Courseware site. So this is where you can download full courses to take um, or just go through. So they have some of their featured ones and new courses on their homepage. But I found that if you use the search bar and you type in intro to, it'll have a lot of introductory courses. So like intro to Japanese culture, intro to linguistics, computer science. And then when you click in, it's going to have a download course button. So it'll download all the course materials. But then on the left hand side here, it also has um, things like assignments, exams related to the course, summaries of lectures, the readings that you'll need to do. Here's another one. This one has less information. So it varies uh, course to course, but you do have access to these. Just remember that you do not get you do not get credit for taking them. Um, uh, like you would as a post-secondary student, but it's available for those who um, want to take post-secondary courses without attending post-secondary. All right, so the following are encyclopedias that I recommend using. Mm -hmm. um, remember, information in encyclopedias is written or gathered by authors who work for that particular encyclopedia, so you'll often get a more cohesive uh, look and formatting to the information than you would with some of the databases and the the links to info that we've seen. So we're going to go over two. We're going to go over encyclopedia.com. Um, and then we're also going to look at World History Encyclopedia, which is specific to world history. So historical topics, civilizations, etc. So encyclopedia.com looks like this. There is also Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, which is a much prettier version of encyclopedia.com. And I'm going to show you this one first. So if I type in Halloween, click on the Halloween article, it's laid out very nicely. There's images, it's very clean looking. Whereas if I go to encyclopedia.com and type in Halloween, um, the search results have this big Google ad at the top. So it's important not to click on any of those links and to scroll down be confusing because they look so similar but these are all the different halloween articles so some of the halloween movies halloween costume halloween but the information just doesn't look as uh nice right it's a little crammed um there's not as many images but the preference is to use this one because encyclopedia britannica will ask you to pay after viewing a certain number of articles Whereas encyclopedia.com does not, it is free. Um, but anything that is blue is linked to another encyclopedia page. Kind of like Wikipedia, you can just keep clicking on, on the different links. This is a really long one, hey? And then usually they'll put at the bottom the resources that they consulted with to write this page. So they are still uh, citing their sources, but it is written by someone who works for encyclopedia.com. Uh, this is the World History Encyclopedia. The search bar is at the top here. 
Um, and you'll notice typing in Halloween, some of the articles are more historical related, right? So history of Halloween, um, Celtic origins of Halloween, Halloween history you don't know. Some of these are videos that the site has created. But again, you can click into them. Anything that is read on this encyclopedia links to other pages. And of course, they have sources that they've consulted with at the very bottom of the article, a little bibliography. So those are some encyclopedias I would recommend if you have patrons who are just looking for general information or students who are coming in and they just need a site that they can poke around on. I'm just waiting for that to go up so I can exit out of it. All right. All right, so the search engines I'm going to show you are mainly searching for scholarly literature or research. And scholarly databases to subscribe to are very expensive. Um, university libraries will subscribe to a, a whole bunch of databases, and then students get access to those databases um, based on like the tuition they pay. So by becoming a student paying tuition, the library gives you access to all sorts of scholarly research. Um, once you are no longer a student, then you no longer get access to those, um, which is kind of troubling, right? Because there's a lot of research and information that you can't actually view unless you pay for, right? Um, or if, unless you're a student at a, a college or university. So the following are uh, resources that I show and search engines that I show are ways to find uh, free access or open access to some scholarly literature so that we don't have to pay, you know, 50, 60 bucks an article or, or look at these uh, really wild subscription prices. But let's talk a little bit about scholarly articles in general. Um, when we're looking at a scholarly article, they, are, they tend to be formatted um, pretty similar to one another. They'll have the title, author details on the front page. We spoke briefly about an abstract, which is just a brief overview of what is contained in the article. That way, someone who is interested in the topic can just read the abstract without having to read the entirety of the article and see if it is applicable to their research or not. It'll usually have, um, whether it is part of a publication or an academic journal, listed somewhere on the article. And then there's the body of the article, the intro, the, the body text, any images or equations that are used. And then, of course, at the end, we have our references, which are all cited in the style appropriate for, for the discipline. Now, how scholarly articles work, and this is a very, very simplified version of how this works. So um, be aware of that. But basically, an academic would write an article, um, which is here. They can choose to submit that article to a specific academic journal for it to be published in that journal. Um, and before that happens, oftentimes it'll have to go through a peer review process. So this will be people who peer review for that article who will often work in the same discipline as um, whatever discipline the article is related to, whether that's like science or medicine or education, et cetera. So the, it is peer reviewed to make sure everything checks out and then it can be published in the journal if the journal takes it. Lots of academics will um, submit articles and work to very uh, established journals and get rejected over and over again. So it can be it can be quite an accomplishment to get um, your work published in certain academic journals. But once it's published, if it is an open access journal, meaning it is freely available information as indicated by this symbol here, then anyone can go onto the journal website and download a PDF copy or an HTML text of that article and they can read it and reference it in their work. If the article has been submitted and published in a, in a journal that is not open access, that you have to pay to access, then you need to pay a fee um, to view the article or you need to be a student where a university has subscribed to that particular journal so the students can have access to all the contents. So that's a little bit about how scholarly work um, works out and how it is published. Um, but it's a big issue, right? Having all this information behind a paywall um, because then only certain people are being able to access that information when it could be open access and then anyone could access it. But that's a, that's a whole like another two hour webinar.
Um, so what we want to do is keep an eye out for open access text and databases and journals. And open access means that everyone has free access to the information and there is unrestricted use of electronic usage. Um, basically meaning that the author or the owner grants the right to use, copy, or distribute the article as long as you are attributing them or citing them correctly. Now, I found this source called um, the Directory of Open Access Journals, and it's a search engine that we can use to find a whole bunch of different open access journals so that we don't have to pay for the articles inside. So we'll take a look at that. But these are the other search engines we're going to look at. Uh, Google Scholar is really, really helpful, especially if you find an article that is behind a paywall. Um, what you can do is take the title of that article, pop it in Google Scholar, and Google Scholar will search the internet and see if there is a free PDF version available, essentially bypassing the, pay the paywall. Um, I'm not encouraging this, but I'm merely showing you the, the tools that are there for you to use if you do run into that kind of situation. Uh, Core is another search engine. It claims to be the world's largest collection of open access articles, which is awesome. Over 270 million free articles. And then Semantic Scholar is uh, the last one we'll take a look at. Again, has like, I think, millions of open access articles linked. Um, and it is AI, AI powered, which is really neat as well. Let's take a look at the directory of open access journals. So again, this is searching for any uh, freely available articles and journals that we can search within. I'm going to type in health and search for journals related to health. And so we can see that we have over 1800 results here. I'm going to use my limiters on the left hand side to narrow down my results. And I'm going to remove any journals that have fees. So I only want to see journals without fees. And so I can go through, I can read the titles, the Journal of Current Oncology and Medical Sciences, Public Health and Toxicology Journal, Frontiers in Health Informatics. That sounds interesting. So it tells you if there are publication fees. It tells you um, if it is open access and if there is any uh, copyright license you need to be aware of. It tells you where it is published from. This one is published in Iran and even tells you what manuscripts are accepted in or what language they're accepted in. This says that they are accepted in English if you are interested in uh, submitting to this journal. But I'm gonna click on the website link and that'll bring me to the journal website. And each of these journal websites is gonna be kind of set up differently. So you might have to do some poking around to find the article you're looking for. Um, but most often, they will have their most recent issue and its articles somewhere on the homepage. So we can see here, volume 12, 2023, sounds like their most recent uh, publication. And then on the right-hand side here, they have additional volumes that have been published in years past. But these are all the different articles that have been published in uh, this year's issue. Um, The Readability Analysis of Online Education Materials for Kidney Transplantation. Interesting. So I can click on that. It'll bring me up uh, the article page. It'll show me the abstract and any references that are used. But what I'm looking for is full text or the PDF button. And I see it right here. And it brings me up a PDF version. Looks like I can download this. And now I have a PDF version of this article. I'm going to save that later. But very cool, a very uh, interesting way to find free journals and free articles on any number of subjects. Now, Google Scholar, I mentioned Google Scholar is a good way to uh, type in the title of an article that is behind a paywall to see if you can find a free version. I'm just going to use the title of this recent article we looked at. We know it's freely available, but I just want to show you how Google Scholar does it. So I input the title of that article. And then what it does is it lists all the articles 
uh, on the left here. On the right, what we're looking for are these uh, PDF for HTML links. So if you find an article and it has this PDF link, chances are when you click on it, oh, it's because I've downloaded it already. <laughs> when you click on it, it's going to download the article for free. Sometimes that's a way if you find you're behind a paywall or it's asking you to pay for the article, type it in here, see if there is a PDF version available and, uh, and freely access it instead. But you can also type in just general search words. Mingo. Uh, some of these are books, but most of it is scholarly literature. Uh, some of these are very sciencey. A review of Captain Flamingo Welfare, a synthesis of current knowledge in future directions. Let's see if that one works. This is saved as a document instead of a PDF. This is like a, a really big one. Very sciencey, not for me. But there's also the flamingo breeding, the role of group displays. And there is a PDF link, so it looks like there is a free version available. And it brings me right to the article. So Google Scholar, highly recommend. Um, really, really great tool. Uh, this is Core. Again, this is another search engine that has access to a whole bunch of different open access articles. We're going to type in butterfly. And so it'll let you know if it has a full text link. These are all the article titles. I can click into it. It gives me the abstract information. I can click download PDF. It brings me to article and this part of it has this some of them will have this kind of title page that they put on um, but this one it looks like it's showing that it's from the journal of insect conservation that's an interesting journal oh and then semantic scholar is the last one type in alberta for this one see what comes up so again, they'll have results here. This is nice. This has um, the open access uh, icon that uh, unlocked lock and PDF. So I know that this one has an open access PDF I can click into if I'm interested in this article. Um, I can also go down here and click into one's methane emissions from oil and gas production sites in Alberta. And if I click on that, Hopefully it'll bring me. Oh yeah, so you see what I did? I clicked on the open access link, which brought me to, it looks like this is the journal that it was published in. And then I'm looking for a PDF for HTML button. There's a PDF button. And now I have access to the article. So you can see how each of these journal websites looks very different from each other. So you do have to do a little bit of poking around just to make sure um, you find the PDF or the open access version you are looking for. But anyway, that is the end of the homework help and databases session. If you have any questions or you want to learn more about any of the web pages we looked at today, you can always contact me at dlatoski at peacelibrarysystem.ab.ca. Um, yeah, and I hope to see you all at the next one. Thanks, everyone.